Hello, my name is Mike. This is Third Avenue Railway System, car number 631. Let's go take a look around the car first. Okay, this is the outside of 631. Here are the two trigs. There's another one at the rear of the car. Nothing strange about those. We have a 12 volt battery box here, uh, unique to this car. We have a 12 volt battery box here, which is unique to this car. I'll talk about that a little bit when we get inside the car. Behind that are the resistor banks. Again, nothing unusual. They're fairly similar to most conventional street cars. Air tank on this car is on the far side. Again, a standard air tank, standard valve. Nothing unusual about that. This car was actually constructed from much older uh, equipment. It was built in 1939, but constructed from much older equipment. Uh, so it's a mixture of old and new. This car is actually constructed from parts from earlier vehicles, so it's a mixture of old and new. The trucks, uh, standard design, uh, nothing very strange about them. It's a standard double-ended street car, with some very unique features to it, I'll point out later on. Uh, it does have helical gears, so it's a nice quiet running car. Other than that, you can treat it uh, as a standard uh, air car. Okay, here we are inside the car. Again, conventional construction. I want to point out the switches to you. This is the heater switch. It's marked zero and one. One, oddly enough, is on. Zero is off. Don't use that during the summer. Standard walkover seats. If you're talking to customers, the seat backs are the original 1939 backs. The cushions have been remade in our shops. When you're talking to our visitors, point out that these seat backs are the original 1939 seat backs, standard walkover seats, and the shop did remake the majority of these seat cushions. Okay, we're still dealing with switches. This is the conductor's, or at least the passenger's, uh, rope. It doesn't work correctly, and I'll explain later on why that is. This is the master lighting switch. There are two of these, uh, both on the right-hand side of the panel. Just turn it, standard rotary switch, always clockwise, uh, and turn it back on again. We need to spend some time talking about lights because they are an uh, important part of this car. Okay. Yeah, all right. Okay, this is the conductor's bell pull, or the passenger's bell pull, I suppose. It uh, doesn't work, and I'll explain why that is. Do you want to that? Yes. <laughs> is there a way to manually override the enclosure? Uh, there probably is, but I'm not aware of what it is. This is the passenger uh, bell rope doesn't work very well, and I'll explain later on why that is. If you're driving the car and the conductor rings two bells, don't sit there waiting. This is the conductor's or passenger's bell rope. As you can tell, it doesn't work very well, and i explain later on why that is. Above it and to the left, and these switches are on the right-hand panels at both ends of the car, is the main lighting switch. Turns all the lights off, all the lights on. It's a standard rotary switch, always clockwise. These switches are at both ends of the car on the right side panel. They're standard rotary switches, always clockwise to turn on, clockwise to turn off, clockwise to turn on. Um, Down below? You were then supposed to cut immediately off the okay. switches. <laughs> okay, okay, all right. Okay, so let's do that again. We still going? Yeah, still rolling. All right. Down so below the it. The switch, the light switch. Oh. We have two master light switches on the right side panels at both ends of the car. The rotary switches turn right clockwise to turn the lights on or off. Clockwise again to turn them back on again.
Down below there, we have a switch that operates the doors at the rear of the car, and I'll demonstrate this a little bit later on. Part of this car's Austrian heritage is they're marked in German or Austrian, Alf and Zu, instead of in and out And just ahead of that is a mark for one and a half meters. We believe that if you were that short, you got a discounted fare. Saying anything? No. Part of this car's Austrian heritage is this one and a half meter sign. We thought perhaps it was because people below that height would get a discounted ticket. But up here above the door, we have a sign that says five years old uh, children are required to pay full fare. Maybe they have very tall kids in Austria. Now then, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about the lights on these cars because it's a really important part of the car. These are the bulbs in the passenger part of the car. There are 21 bulbs altogether. They're all in one big happy series circuit. Okay, now I need to spend a couple of minutes to talk about the lights on this car. We're in the passenger saloon of the car. These are the light bulbs, obviously. There are 15 of them inside this part of the car. There are a total of 21 bulbs on the car. I'm going to leave you to find the rest of them, and it is critical that you do find the rest of them and that they are all lit. The way they work is they are 32 volt PCC bulbs. They're self-shorting bulbs. To complicate matters, they're all in one big circuit, in addition to which the two headlight bulbs are in series with each other. So if you take 32 volts and divide it into 600, um, you don't end up with exactly 21 bulbs. The point is, they're expensive bulbs, they're hard to get hold of, and if they start to blow, um, we can run up some major expense very quickly, as we did a couple of years ago. The problem is, the bulbs are self-shorting bulbs, the sockets are self-shorting bulbs, at least in this part of the car. Self-shorting sockets, that is, at least in this part of the car. If a bulb goes out, the rest of the bulbs receive extra voltage. If two bulbs go out, the, the extra bulbs, the rest of the bulbs, receive a lot of extra voltage and will very, very quickly fail. You can see they're pretty bright now, and yet they're only 50 watt bulbs nominally. So it's real important, if a bulb goes out, uh, that it is replaced. It's especially important to check the headlight bulbs, the ones in the ceiling above the motorman and in the sign box to make sure they're all lit. When the car's in neutral, the two headlight bulbs are very, very dim and in bright sunlight, it's hard to see whether they're on or not. Very important that you check this any time you run the car. 21 bulbs and they must all be on. Now this is the tool compartment for this car and you can see here the very unique tools, the brake pedal and a standard controller key. The brake pedal, oddly enough, goes into the brake system. The brake pedal goes into the braking system. Push it in, twist to the left, and that's where it is. And I'll show you how this works in a few minutes. The brake pedal goes into the brake cylinder this way, 45 degrees, turn to the left a little bit, and that's installed. This is where the car starts to get complicated. Now this is where this car starts to get complicated. things individually and then show you how they all work. Nothing strange about it. All up, pretty standard K-type controller. Breakers in this car up in Control circuit. So the car won't move when I operate this controller. Like I said, it's a standard K type controller. The first point is the line switch. Okay, first of all, the controller, I've got the controller switch off and the breaker. This is where the car starts to 
I'm going to show you a few things now, and then we'll look at how they all interact together. I've got the controller breaker on, so I'm not going to move if I move anything. Standard K-type controller. The first point is actually the line switch. Switching control. You can activate the line switch. Okay, now the very first thing you'll see is this is the brake pedal. It's in the up position and it works exactly the opposite direction from the car, from the brake pedal in your own car. To release the brakes, you press the brake pedal. What you're activating here is a fairly normal straight air valve. If you were to lay down sideways, you've got a lap position in here somewhere and you've got the apply position. The apply position is up here. The pedal should come up a little bit more than that. Like that. That's the apply position. You can't apply any pressure to that yourself. It comes up on the action of the spring and air pressure. And that's how you apply the brake. So to release the brakes, you press down on the pedal. To apply the brakes, take your foot off, and it will come up to that position. Here we are back on the controller. Once again, you've got the line switch on the first point. We've got the switching controller here. The second point, line switch still works. Three more points up to series, which as I mentioned is just a little bit off center and off. Now then, there are many interlocks on this car. Did you notice uh, the car didn't move when I moved the controller? That's because the brake pedal is in the up position. Now, the way to run this car is to think of it running in New York City. I'm going to do something that you'd never, ever want to do on any other car. Put the controller on the second point. Nothing's moving. This is one of the interlocks. As soon as I press the brake pedal down, Nothing happens. Okay, now we need to talk about interlocks on this car. I'm going to do something that you should never do on any other car. I'm going to put power on the car. The car has not moved. One of the interlocks, this is where the car starts to get complicated. We need to talk about interlocks. I'm going to do something you should never do on any car, and that is to bring the controller onto the first point. The line switch is in, the car is not moving. As soon as I press the brake pedal down, Here's a different view of the same thing. The controller is still in the second point. I'm going to now I'm going to start the car from a standstill. Notice that I'm sitting down. I'm taking the fares from the customers coming on board just as I would have in New York City. The doors are open. The brakes are applied. The key is in the forward position, and I'm going to put it onto the first notch. I'm still taking fares from the customers. We're ready to go. All I have to do, look, no hands. And we move a block or two. And we want to pick up some more customers. I open the door, and I say welcome on board. Now the last thing we did was to stop the car and I opened the door using the door button. While we're here, there's the gong and there's the horn. That's for when we're running on the main line. What we're going to deal with right now is the door. The door is open. I'm going to show you the safe way of securing the car. Okay, the last thing we did was to stop the car and I used the door switch here on the console. While we're here, let's look at the gong and the horn that we use when we're running on the main line. For right now, I'm going to show you the safe way of securing the door. The door is open, the key is in forward, and, 
and I'll show you how to lock the door out. Um, that didn't matter. Sorry, I'm not going to uh, do it. I'm not push, gonna push the button. The door is open. The key is in forward. Uh, Louis at the back. Okay. Okay. You, you want me speaking? Yeah, sure. Why not? Right. Go. The door is open as it was when we stopped. I press the door open button. Remember, the key is in forward. I have shut the controller off, although I didn't really need to. Now, above the door at both ends, there is a valve which isolates the door motor. This is the door motor. Excuse me, this is the door motor. With the Okay, at both ends of the car uh, are these panels over the doors. Each one contains this uh, valve which isolates, which isolates the door motor. This will hold the doors uh, in the open position. Now I can turn the controller key off. Okay, what I want to show you now is the correct way to bring the car to a standstill. I want to show you the correct way of bringing the car to a standstill and isolating the doors. This is a big safety issue. Because of the interlocks, if you operate any controls here, the doors may slam on somebody, and I've seen that happen a number of times. So we're rocking along in the car. I brought the car to a standstill at the station. I press the door button to open the doors. You can tell the doors have opened. Now I'm going to secure the doors. I am not going to touch this controller switch. The doors are now isolated from the air mechanism. I can do anything I like here, and it won't affect the doors. All right. Okay, I'm going to open the door using the button on the console. Okay, I've brought the car to a standstill. I open the door using the button on the console. Note, I do not touch the key. I'm going to isolate the door motor. And now I can do anything I want to here, and it won't affect the doors. Now, the only downside to this is as the air leaks off of those pistons, these doors will begin to rattle around. Because there's only one central pole here, we've had some customers uh, grab the edge of the door and discover it's not as stable as they would like it to be. So just be aware of that. Not a big issue, but something you should know about.